So to begin with, Rachel Barnard is the founder and executive director of Young New Yorkers, as well as a public artist in residence in the New York City Department of Probation and Department of Cultural Affairs. Rachel's incredible practice deploys her design skills outside of the traditional bounds of the field through direct collaborations with young people. Rachel is a licensed architect. She earned her master's in architecture from Columbia Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation, and has worked in offices such as Rogers Marvel Architecture. But she currently runs Young New Yorkers, which is an art and design program for 16 and 17 year old defendants who have been charged with crimes and prosecuted as adults in New York State. Defendants can choose to participate in her program, which involves discussions and creative design projects on themes of accountability and leadership. And upon successful completion, their case will be sealed and they won't have the burden of a crim criminal record. As a committee, before we even understood the enormous impact of Rachel's work, we were struck by the exuberant environments and participatory events that Rachel and her young collaborators create. Rachel's strong visual sensibility weaves through the work of her program, even as it testifies to a radical conception of authorship, one that is entirely merged with and supportive of the lived experiences of young people. So welcome, Rachel. Um, hello. Uh, I just wanted to thank, first of all, the Architectural League of New York. I've been an enormous fan of theirs for decades, and it's a real honour and um, a thrill to have this honour, so thank you. Um, and I also want to shout out the um, Young New Yorkers community who I partner with on this work. You guys are awesome, especially the young people that are here today. <laughs> Um, so, um, thank you for that great introduction. Um, very briefly, what Young New Yorkers does is we provide a true alternative to incarceration for 16 and now up to 25-year-olds. Um, but while we, while we do that, while people are sentenced to us, we also do cultural change work. We have celebrations inside the courtroom that give a new way for criminal legal professionals and the young people that they've sentenced to our program to interact and know each other. And we believe this leads to better discretionary practices inside the courtroom and in other criminal legal spaces. So we're very committed to ending the local impacts of mass incarceration and centering young people in that process or um, the people that have been impacted the most. So the, the title of the talk is Transformative Justice. And I just ask you to think, what do you think about when you think about transformative justice? Do you think about transforming young people's lives or their experience with the system? Or do you think about transforming the system itself? So this is one of our missions. We're a young organisation, so it swirls around a bit. But as you can see, um, the way that we look at transformative justice is transforming the system itself. Um, so these are some of our young people. Um, and that's because uh, we're kind of a bit beyond 30 years of the era of mass incarceration here in the United States. Um, and that shows up in um, a lot of complicated ways um, that I'm going to unpack very briefly uh, right now. Um, so up until the tough on crime uh, political rhetoric happened, it was, sorry, I'm really nervous. It's the Architectural League. <laughs> How embarrassing. <laughs> Thank you. This is live feed, God. Anyway, um, uh, up until that moment, um, it was very normal to um, treat 16 and 17 year olds especially in a restorative way. Um, this was the mainstream. And, and now we have terms like alternatives to incarceration that while are great and are looking towards restorative practices, still centre incarceration. And the language that we use um, really reflects the way that things are ha happening in the system. But young people are being criminalised for what we would normally deem as um, developmentally appropriate behaviour just, you know, 30 or 40 years ago. Um, and all the science uh, supports that. 
The second way that it's shown up um, that's particularly devastating uh, is the racial disparities. Uh, you can see in these pie charts here that um, 16 and 17 year olds um, who are black or Latino are 33% of the New York City population. They make up 72 of the people that we arrest and 95% of the people that we choose to incarcerate. And I think um, if we're very honest, we need to realise that we don't incarcerate our children. And there's some kind of secret assumption that I think we have, which is that those are those young, enter any word out there. And one of the things that Young New Yorkers aims to do is remind us that, no, these are our young people too. And finally, it's just the enormity of the system now and what Judge Grasso refers to as the churn. It's so exhausting. You um, go to work every day and um, many people move through your courtroom. It can be disappointing. And the way that uh, court appearance happens is that you stand silently beside your lawyer. They speak to, to the judge across the way. Um, at the other desk is the prosecutor. You probably don't know what's happening, happening and then out in the corridor you're, you find out what your plea deal means and what the implications are going to be. Um, so in this context, I think success should not be measured solely by the so-called reform of young people, which is very much the dominant way that we talk about this today, but by the reform of the criminal legal system itself. And I think that um, programs like mine, and there are many, many good ones, um, need to do both. So, um, young New Yorkers, first of all, it's art, not jail. So you're sentenced to us instead of jail or other adult sanctions like community service. Uh, and then you most often, um, on the successful completion of our program, you'll um, have your case dismissed and sealed. Uh, so. Uh, this is one of those um, secret impacts of the criminal legal system in some communities on some young people, but the collateral consequences of a lifelong criminal record are complicated um, and they narrow uh, your life significantly. Um, most likely you need access to social services and uh, many of the collateral consequences will deny you things like housing, social services, uh, access to scholarships for your education, and so on. Um, then the uh, third thing about Young New Yorkers is that every program includes art advocacy. That means you get to turn up to your court date, your next court date, or to, uh, on the completion of your program, have an exhibition where you get to advocate directly to the people that sentenced you um, for yourself, but also for a reformed criminal legal system. And we believe this leads to transformative justice. We think that this practice, when you're a prosecutor or a lawyer, a defence lawyer or a judge, um, or even a guard, and you get to be in our exhibitions and playfully engage uh, with the young people, that it's incredibly humanising for the cultures of the courtroom and the criminal legal system at large. And uh, we believe that this leads to better discretionary practices uh, for countless young people to come. Uh, we have a working theory, and it's not provable, but we work as though it were true that we could end mass incarceration just by changing the discretionary practices that already exist at every point of contact you may have with the criminal legal system. So how did I, um, a former architect, go on <laughs> to uh, start um, a not-for-profit that is essentially an arts diversion program for young people. Um, I forgot what I was going to say at this slide. <laughs> I'm not a very formal person, so this is very challenging. Um, so uh, basically, uh, I was very fortunate about seven or eight years ago to win what's known as the Goodman Fellowship from Columbia's architecture school, and it was for a architectural project of social significance. And I proposed Young New Yorkers. It was going to be a one-off public art project. Young people who had been arrested and were being prosecuted were going to come together, and we were going to develop a public art project that talked about why are 16 and 17-year-olds being prosecuted 
As adults, what do we want to say, given that we're too young to vote and meaningfully impact change? Um, and then uh, once I won, um, I was a little overwhelmed. So the first thing I did was start a working group and we met every two weeks for about 10 months. And on that working group were two defence attorneys and they kept saying, well, if this is going to be a program, why don't we make it a court mandated program? And one morning they um, snuck slash ushered me into court and past the security guards and through the back uh, while one of the judges was setting up his bench and we pitched this idea of a restorative arts diversion program. We said we had funding from Columbia University. We didn't mention that it was from the architecture school. And uh, uh, he agreed to court mandate it. At that time, uh, Ju Chief Judge Lippman had just announced he wanted to raise the age. And so people were looking for different ways to sentence young people. And, you know, we developed um, a very rigorous process around restorative justice. We take all of those things very seriously when it comes to our development and taking account for our actions um, and creating positive futures. Um, but I'm going to focus on the transformative justice art advocacy component this evening, and I'm going to look at three projects. This, though, is um, the first exhibition we had. So it started as a public art project, and even though it was now court mandated, I didn't want to put down the public art component of the project. And so we had an elaborate exhibition and um, Sachin, in his public art proposal, which is the last two classes of the program, had come up with an idea where everyone in his neighbourhood on New Year's Day could go to the Brooklyn Bridge, write down their dreams, and hundreds of people could fly them over the bridge at the same time, thereby being a collective memory and a spectacle to remember for the rest of the year about having dreams and achieving those dreams. And I was like, that's the easiest one to realise, we're doing that. And he very proudly went around to all the probation staff, the prosecutors, the defence attorneys and the judges and asked them to write their dreams down on a piece of paper and then fold them into a paper aeroplane. And when everyone very happily stood on this stadium seating and on the count of three threw their paper aeroplanes in the air side by side with the young people that they had sentenced, I realised that we were onto something. So... This exhibition is called Unity, and this group of students were very concerned, as are um, many students with police brutality, and they wanted to create an uh, experience where they could disappear police brutality and come up with a new vision of what might be possible. What it involved was um, creating like an outside picnic, although inside, <laughs> but that's, you know, the aesthetic, this playful aesthetic, and people would come in and they would write down what their visions were for um, the relationship between people in the community and uh, police, uh, what, what was missing, what needed to be put in place, and they would write that down and they would take it across the room to the unity wall, which was made out of 200 purple roses. Um, which was the colour that the young people chose. And the word unity um, was the final word on their treaties about um, owning up to the past around um, policing um, before we could ever finally come together as, as one group of people. So um, we invited the NY NYPD. Um, the young people requested that I asked them to not bring guns, and I did request that, but they politely declined. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I will almost do anything that, um, and any topic that they suggest. And in, everyone would write their visions, um, as you can see here, and they would be tied onto the unity wall, and in exchange, you would get a rose. So this led to, um, and you also made police badges for yourself, which, you know, this police officer's commitment to community policing was courage and trust. And uh, it led to these funny scenes where uh, police officers had roses that were given to them by the young people that had been arrested um, in their holster. This is um, courtroom spectacular. Uh, these, this group of young people um, 
took the courtroom and using just simple cardboard and their collages for how they wish the courtroom was like, created a whole new space, um, an, ex an immersive experience uh, for the people that came to their exhibition. And they were very interested in the brain science um, behind our work. Why were um, people held account for the rest of their lives when they had a very normal brain development that led them to be <laughs> impulsive? So they had people come in and do a quiz, um, but first they had to identify what brain development they had. So if you were between 13 and 25, you got an adolescent brain um, token. If you were over 25, you got an adult brain, over 70, a senior brain, and under 13, you had a child's brain. And so everyone wore medallions that immediately showed what their brain development was. And then you took this quiz saying, if you're 17 and you're arrested and you get a record, how long does it last? And on a scale of one to 10, how, what kind of impact do you think that has? And so here's the head judge at the Eastern District Court listening to Hectavius, who is here, explain about the quiz and very happily doing a quiz um, for Hectavius on, um, I believe, a senior uh, brain <laughs> <laughs> card. Uh, and then depending on how much you got right, you um, were awarded brain stars, and then you went to, to behind um, the installation um, and keeping that in mind, like what was your vision for the future of young people in the city and the f future of justice in the city, and you wrote it on your future parlour, ink your vision card. And then they turned the judges bench into a tattoo parlour because half of this class wanted to become tattoo artists. Gene, who is here, was part of this class, and he is um, got his apprenticeship now and uh, they would read your visions for the future very solemnly one-on-one -on -one, and then they would gift you a word of affirmation to go forth to realize this vision so here you have the young people that have been manhandled through the system reaching out and touching you and offering you a generous word of affirmation for your vision not only for yourself but the future of our city people love it and then you tied your visions and your wishes, your best wishes for New York City to um, a hydrangea um, because hydrangeas look like brains and, <laughs> and you put it in a, in a, in a bucket and then here's Jean um, uh, giving a random hydrangea to two judges who are exiting the courtroom um, so that they can inherit the dreams of other people and, and feel the goodwill and how we're all connected. Um, and then this is the final uh, exhibition I'll show you this evening, which is one we just did two weeks ago, um, again in the Eastern District Court called Clear Vision. This group of extraordinary young people were very interested in uh, racism and privilege and the complicated ways that that plays out in the criminal legal system. Uh, but, you know, so the first thing that you would do on arrival is you would fill out what was called your invisible triumph, triumphs card. So it would be one of those typical cards where, you know, have you ever not known when your next meal is going to be from? Have you ever experienced homelessness? And for every tri invisible triumph you've overcome, you were awarded a gem. And that gem was put on your eye patch because, after all, it was called clear vision, eye patch, not having clear vision, this is... And so here you have a young person who was graduating just two weeks ago and a lawyer. One has a beautiful gemstone, rhinestone, abundant, um, invisible triumphs he's overcome, and the other has one token um, gemstone, um, and they're both pretty pleased to have that connection and have that be made visible and it just kind of deepens the way that you can relate to another person. Uh, then from there again we went into just acknowledging what you're grateful for from the city to say even though some of us have invisible triumphs at the same time there is so much to be grateful for and we talk about simultaneity I'm so nervous I can't say words, um, and I'm not going to try again. <laughs> It'll be a hamster wheel of <laughs> repeating words. But um, 
uh, that things are true at the same time. We do wonderful, generous things every day, and every day we very likely do something that's stingy. The young people may have made some mistakes, and at the same time they're wise beyond their years and have something extraordinary to offer us. And so we put this practice into New York. Yes, sometimes we have to triumph over the city, but at the same time, let's acknowledge it for everything that it offers us. And then once you had done that, you would go up to Shaunti, who's sitting in the witness box, and she would do an elaborate ceremony with you where she would say, here at Young New Yorkers, we know that the greatness you see in other people is the greatness that is in you. And she would make you say, repeat after me, holding a mirror, which I won't get into, but again, vision, um, in your right hand, if you had described New York City as um, diverse, as um, What's a word we could call New York City? Give me a word. Busy of, of gratitude, vibrant, unstoppable. So you would say, repeat after me, I am unstoppable. And everything you've just acknowledged the city for, you would just then formally be made to acknowledge yourself for. So at this point, you're feeling pretty good, as you can see in the photos. Um, uh, and then you went through the exhibition. Um, I haven't finished this because I did this presentation at the last moment, but here are two graduates that keep returning, and I think that's something very special about the Young New Yorkers community, that we have monthly dinners and graduates come back to support other graduates on a regular basis. Um, and then here we have the participants speaking from the judges' bench. No criminal legal person speaks. Uh, no adult speaks, it's just the young people and they take the position in the courtroom that is usually the position of authority. And this is me, that not normally taking the front seat, but uh, this is just really to give credit to the very vibrant community of young New Yorkers, volunteers, friends, staff and graduates that make um, not only the exhibition outside possible, but all of these possible, we have four of these a year. They're all very different and vibrant. We turn them around in about seven days. Um, and yeah, it's just very wonderful and I'm very grateful to you all. And to all of you, thank you for listening. <laughs>